crack of lightning reflected off his reading lenses while he sat at his wooden desk. Looking up, Alistair gazed out of the window at the droplets of rain running down the glass, and the storm-drenched branches peering around the frame. A cup of coffee next to him was still steaming, despite sitting there for what seemed like hours. His fingers covered by black gloves, he turned through the codex of ancient Roman provenance. Sometime within the first century AD, he postulated. He finally took another sip of coffee before sliding over to his notebook, pen in hand, and scribbling. In every vein is linga pata sanguinis, in your river sticks dwells pata sanguinis. Father blood. He typed out the same on his laptop for safe measure. He grew later and darker, and the most important work of all needed to be done from home. Alistair put the codex back in its airtight bag, threw on his black raincoat, removed his glasses, and slid the rest of his stuff in his auburn satchel. After pulling the metal beaded string of the green Art Deco lamp on his desk, he stepped out of the office and closed the door, an autumn drift slamming it shut in protestation of his delicate pool. Department of Greek and Roman Studies, the sign read as it trembled. Exiting the university, he stepped out in the rain, sheltering a satchel behind his coat, and jogged to the last car in the staff parking lot. Alistair pulled out into the bustling, sleepless New York streets, and merged into the unending rows of light. The sole lamp on his Vinegar Hill Street shone over the empty intersection, its faint buzzing dominating the nearby soundscape. Unlocking the main door, he marched up to the third floor, a box labeled Fragile was waiting outside of his residence. Although a bit worn around the edges, it was in surprisingly pristine condition. Pulling out his key, Alistair unlocked the door for apartment 306 and picked up the box before making his way inside. He had left the window sill open this morning, and the window sill was now soaked. In the still dark living room, he walked over to the window and closed it. The pouring rain's roar somewhat diminished. Resting his satchel on the reddish reading chair, he turned the floor lamp in the corner on and grabbed a small pair of scissors from the kitchen to open the package. Inside were foam kernels and an object encased in taped bubble wrap. Underneath was an exportation document in Italian, which he showed no interest in even skimming. Carefully removing the final protective layer, he cautiously held the knife with both hands, his palms facing the ceiling. The slightly rusted blade was cold to the touch, and its hilt sharp. A red sapphire was encrusted in the center of the dagger's pommel, with what seemed to be a droplet of sorts at its core. Along the blade, parallel lines stretched down to its tip, finally meeting, not unlike common Roman daggers Alistair was familiar with in his field. In the middle of the cross guard, however, a face stared back at him, one he knew, and a sinister smile formed upon his face in return. A match was struck, and the single red candle on the living room table lit up. The dagger rested upon a black cloth before it as Alistair rummaged through the kitchen cupboards in search of something. He returned to the table with a large ceramic bowl and placed it next to the Roman blade. Taking the codex out of its bag, the time for caution had passed, and those black gloves were no longer needed. Barehanded, he carried the document over to the desk in the back corner, a grimacing Roman death mask peering from the wall above, and turned on another small lamp. A final moment of inspection before it would all begin. There was no room for error, but there was seemingly no one better equipped than Alistair, with his extensive knowledge of ancient Rome, Latin, and of course, the most malignant facets of occultism. Perhaps naturally, this he had left out of the biographical professor blurbs on the university website. Feeling confident in his understanding of the ceremony, he returned to the dagger, took a deep breath, and bent down to grab the hilt with his right hand. Positioning his empty hand above the bowl, he stabbed at his palm and drew blood. Soon, Pata Sanguinis would come. Before a droplet could even fall into the container, the dagger began to consume the blood pouring out from his hand, sliding up the blade and enveloping it. The eyes upon the cross guard's visage briefly lit up a crimson red, as if authenticating an event. Alistair's muscles tightened, 
causing his hand to squeeze the dagger hilt, and his veins aggressively rose to the surface of his skin. A force pried his arms to his side, forearms outward facing, and straightened his back. His feet bent forward, now rigidly on the tip of his toes, and he could gaze nowhere but forward. Beyond the table stood a figure, dominant in its presence. From an ashen face, marbled by red cracks, pierced volcanic red eyes, emanating a warmth not unlike that which charred the fleeing Pompeians on his hallway mural. Atop broad shoulders was a dark red garment, a toga, coming down just above blackened Roman leather footwear, seemingly stained by something far more potent than wine. Tightening the garment closer to his body was a dark brown chingulum, ornamented in a manner uncommon to the belts of Roman legionaries or centurions. Alistair looked on in gleeful horror at the culmination of what felt like an eternity of research. Overwhelmed, he could not bear the excitement. The droplets of blood trickling out of his hand formed into a current of blood, streaming rapidly across the room into the abdomen of this most ancient being, and scattering into the red lines covering his skin what could be seen of it. Alistair felt himself grow slightly weaker as the droplets began to slow, but he still had plenty of ounces to offer. You be young, so you shall continue. The crimson lips crossed utter deeply. The grip around his right arm loosened and he reached over to his left forearm, still outstretched, slashing at it with the blade. A diagonal cut quickly surfaced, and the wound was forced open as another stream of blood shot across the beast's extended arm, swelling up to once again vanish in the marbling. This one had struck deep into the owner artery, causing a veritable sanguinary river to flow across the table and between Pater's now two outstretched arms. A crash of thunder in the outside world he had forgotten frightened him out of his stupor as he continued to be drained. Wait, wait! Alistair cried out. More! I'll get you more! The demon, or whatever he had been to the blood-crazed Roman men who dared summon him in times of war, lowered his arms and let out a tenebrous chuckle. Pata tilted his head to the side, a smile setting into his face. Alistair suddenly dropped down and his knees crashed into the hardwood floor. Staring down, he took a moment to envision himself ascending, to be of equal stature as this being he offered his precious life force to to be sired by Pata Sanguinis. Lightning pierced through the corridor window as Alistair opened his apartment door and briefly illuminated the divide between his and his neighbor's abodes. The flash revealed Pata now standing to his left at the end of the communal hallway, watching his every move. The uncovered portion of the dagger in his rear pocket glimmered in synchronicity. Were not what he was about to do next so dreadful he might have been more terrified. It was nearing midnight, and most residents would be fast asleep by this time. He had been friendly with the man across, a programmer, about as friendly as he felt himself capable of being, so this would somewhat remove a degree of suspicion, though it was still very late after all. Alistair knocked on the door, mentally preparing his dialogue and awaiting an unseen eye behind the people. A few seconds later, he heard the wheels of a computer chair rolling. He was awake, and bathing in a sea of blue light, likely the only luminescence in his apartment at this time. The 29-year-old bachelor slid the chair back, twisted the deadbolt, and opened the door. Alistair? He asked, puzzled. The storm is getting out of hand, isn't it? The professor laughed. I don't mean to bother you this hour, I just know you're much better than me with this sort of thing. I was remotely logged into the university network looking through student submissions and uploading my presentations for the next week, and for whatever reason my internet failed and I was booted from the network. The neighbor was leaning on the edge of the door and let out a, huh, before he could formulate a sentence. Alistair continued, I'm sure it has something to do with this weather, but would you mind taking a look? I've already restarted the router, but to no avail. He turned back, quickly looking over his shoulder and retreated towards his apartment. The programmer followed. Perfect. Moments after entering, the neighbor would finally spot the blade protruding from the black pants pocket, but not fast enough. Alistair quickly spun around, 
simultaneously drawing the dagger, and pounced at the man standing in front of his bathroom. The blade sunk into the side of his neck, a pair of arms extended towards him in defense. His clenched fist rose back up as spurts of warm blood streaked his face and turned the nearby wall into an experimental art piece. Alistair wound his arm up again and coldly drove the dagger into his trachea this time, making any possible screams of agony or help impossible. Hands reaching out and determined now wrapped around deep, newly acquired wells of blood. The programmer tripped against the wall, adding an extra layer to the canvas as his red and left hand slid down the surface. His right hand continued to attempt to salvage the precious fluid. Pato reappeared where he first stood and raised his arms towards the heavens, his head pointed up in ecstasy. The blood trajectory changed from the surroundings to the being once more. The helpful neighbor was already on his way out of this world, but Alistair gripped his skull with both hands before viciously smashing it to the side of the kitchen island, twice. Had it been into the wall, the elderly woman next door might have possibly been awoken, but the storm outside made it all the more difficult to discern what was happening. The latest offering finally closed his eyes. Blood steadily continued to flow in rivers as he now lay on his side, head facing the wall, arms stretched out towards the very one he was to be drained for. This accusatory gesture should have been reserved for the summoner. A stillness spread throughout the apartment as Alistair inspected the mess he had made. Leaning against the kitchen counter, his palms gripping its edge, strings of dark blonde hair knotted by blood hung down his forehead. He looked up across the room at Pato inquiringly, and their gazes locked. Maintaining eye contact with so nefarious a being took almost everything he had left in him. Almost everything. Is this not enough? He asked in a contained manner. He wanted to shout, to beg even, but he couldn't muster up the strength to do so. It is never enough. Your inner rivers of filth, of impurities, must all converge, the statuesque figure declared. Let what remains of the putrescent vitae flowing through you be a part of me. Then may you see from mine eyes. Then may you join me. Alistair stumbled out from behind the counter and walked what would be his last mortal steps to the living room. Raising the dagger, he slid it across his throat, from left to right, as a violin bow does across strings. Rather than a beautiful sharp sound, his was a gurgle. Pato wasted no time, and the blood was immediately siphoned into his mouth. Alistair was bled dry before his body could hit the floor. Just as it did, a black vacuum appeared out of thin air and swallowed whole the Ancient One and his unknowing, eternal servant. A great emptiness filled the apartment, save for a red mist in the air and the lifeless neighbor, his face occasionally lit by flashes of lightning. The living room was in disarray, with the table and reading chair now flipped over. Various Greco-Roman artifacts decorating the space were sprawled out across the floor. Documents and other papers, among them the studied text, were drawn to the center of the room and momentarily drifted in the air before succumbing to gravity. The codex landed open wide, displaying lines of Latin script. At the bottom of the left page was an all too familiar face, its eyes painted with droplets of crimson. Beyond this void spanned a labyrinthian network of ominous, discolored classical buildings, some perhaps temples, interspersed between colossal pools of blood, each with thousands of souls gathered around them. Alistair did not awaken as an equal to Peter, as he so deeply desired and thought guaranteed. No, he was merely a servant, one of many. The professor opened his eyes to the ghastly and tormented faces of countless others like him, who, throughout various millennia, had coveted more. Stirring lakes of red with netted rods, revealing deformed, eel-like creatures slithering and biting at their captors. They were forever destined to filter through the grime of human adulteration amassed before them. Over the innumerable screams of anguish to be heard, Alistair could discern the faint echo of a single word, 
spoken in that same deep voice. Sang.